everybody. Did everybody have trouble? tearing themselves out of the sunshine to come in here and Zoom. Actually, I'm still outside. I'm on the porch. I'm jealous. And I was a hot, sweaty mess until about five minutes ago. Talk in my language. <laughs> We're going to give it a... a two or three more minutes to let everybody file on in here. I must have selected the um, that I have to admit people. So I'm trying to keep an eye on that. I didn't mean to do that. Okay. We'll keep all the riffraff out that way. <laughs> well, I'm here, Jesse, so <laughs> already <laughs> For that one. That's right. So now that we're seeing participant screens, um, is there still the link available to the um, the download? Do you mean for the recording? Um, no, when the screen first came up before you opened the meeting, there was something about the speaker had uploaded slides and it looked like it was from a Colorado chapter. Did anybody oh, else see yeah. that? It was from what's called the Front Range chapter, and it was Colorado. I did see that. It said tonight's speaker's notes are available for download. Yeah. And yeah, it definitely okay. said somebody from Colorado. Yeah, okay, so I'm not crazy. Yeah. No, I'm not. I saw I did it not see that. Also, Wild Ones is having a meeting tonight, I think, for a, with a designer. Oh, yeah, for the Midwestern Gardens, they did. Yeah, yep. Yeah, so, so maybe that's what you saw. They are, the Wild Ones is having a meeting, a, okay. a designer. It was the um, front range chapter, which like Rick said, looked like it was from Colorado. Do they provide the Zoom link, Jesse? Um, Wild Ones has several Zoom accounts that I can right. use to set up the meetings, yep. So I think that's why it may have popped up because you're using one of their Zoom accounts. Maybe. Right, that's probably what it was. Jesse, it's so pretty great. out here tonight. Just amazing. Yeah, the sun's really nice. I um, want to be outside. I want to be with all of you. I wish we were outside. Right. We can come meet on my porch. It's going to be a little crowded, but <laughs> We'll wear masks. It'll be okay. <laughs> no, we're done. we're done with the masks. Well, not really. So Marilyn, that... Um, uh, Packer that you gave me last year, it's popping up all over the place. It looks beautiful. Good. I mean, mine is too. And it, it, real, it will spread. So if you, uh, you might want to cut off the flower seed heads, but I don't, I just let it go. No, that's the point. I need it all over my back woods. So I'm very grateful. Is it already for blooming? No, it's got the uh, flower stalks about yay right. high. Right. Yeah. 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 And they're pink, but the flowers are not pink, are they? Correct. The so flowers the buds are, are purple. They're, 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 yeah, they're a little dark color. Yeah, they, yeah. Uh, they'll, they'll, it, the flowers are yellow. Yeah. And the it's sweet really heads will be white. So it has spread, like you said. So I'm looking forward to that. Great. That's I like good. spready things. <laughs> I love free plants. The great plant. Right. That was the most appreciated. Yeah. Ooh, Thanks. For and, and, you know, and, oh, the other thing I have is the, um, oh, shoot, I always forget the name. Robin something, right? Prolificum. Arigeron. Uh, um, Pardon me? Arigeron? No, it's it's the bush. Um, it's the um, Hypericum, Prolificum. I have lots of babies around. Oh, I don't it's, have that. Well, I'll dig some up 
and I'll okay. bring them. I'll bring them tomorrow if I get if I get a chance. Are you going to be there at twelve thirty? I can. Or you're okay. going to be there early, aren't you? No, I think somebody said twelve thirty, so that's what I was shooting for. It depends on what Audrey wants. Okay. In case that's anybody right. else is wondering, the twelve thirty thing is for the board members to get your plants from Octorero. So, right. Fortunately, it's not a it's not a party. It is a party, but not a we'll make it a party. Jesse. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Twelve thirty yeah. is good, guys. That's good. perfect. Thanks, okay. Audrey. Okay, yep. great. We'll see okay. you guys. Awesome. I have that we are two minutes, three minutes past. So let me share my screen and get this party started. Uh, I think this is the one. Yeah, man. Okay. And our faces are always in the way. It doesn't matter. Okay. So, let's see how we can do this. I have to read. I'm sorry. Thank you guys so much for coming to our monthly Wild Ones of Southeastern PA chapter meeting. Welcome to all the new and the familiar faces. So glad you could be with us. Um, we've gotten seven new members since our last meeting, and that puts our total up to 39 already since chartering in January. I'm so excited about our growth. Um, we're getting more traffic on Facebook. I think we're getting people to join from there also, so that's great. Um, anytime you want to give a hand with getting the chapter moving in a certain direction or getting things going, please just reach out and let us know. I want to just make sure that I'm trying to figure out how to make sure I'm not excluding anybody um, because I have to admit people. So let me just take a second. I'm hoping that it will just tell me if somebody wants to come in. Let's hope. Okay. Um, for those of you who aren't sure, this is the chapter um, officers, and uh, it's a great group of people to work with. I'm so excited that they spend their time and energy making wild ones happen. Um, we each have important roles that we do. I'm so thankful that uh, these great people are putting their talents to great use here with our group. Um, Susan puts together an email after each meeting with highlights to share, and she is also the person that puts a lot of our content on Facebook. Thank you so much. So great. Lindy reaches out to all of the new people who are making inquiries about the chapter. So she does um, our promoting once people have interest. Um, Audrey creates the thought of the month content. I'm so excited for that again this evening. Michelle tackles all of our finance things and our first big finance issue is with the Octorero order. So that's great. And Mother Marilyn inspires us every month at our board meetings to come up with new and interesting and great things to do for the chapter. So if you ever have any questions or need anything, feel free to reach out to any of us. Um, the wild ones of SEPA at Gmail is the best way to contact us and I can forward the information to whoever is the strongest suit for that. This is um, what our YouTube channel looks like. If you ever miss a meeting, feel free to go there. They are uploaded within a couple days. That way you don't miss any great content or any good speakers that we have on. Um, we have some new members. When somebody decides to join the chapter, we send an email uh, welcoming them and we ask them if they would like a shout out. Uh, sometimes they tell us a great story about why they joined or what they have going on. And so you can see we are getting members from all over Southeastern PA. So it's very exciting. Um, this month, we didn't have anybody who wanted to specifically share or have a shout out. So I just listed their areas. So you can see if there's somebody close by, we can try and get you in touch, make sure. Um, and then you can work on projects in your local areas together. Our first ever chapter group sale went so great. 
Um, I appreciate everybody who was patient about all the emails that had to go out because we needed that five per species requirement. Oh, look, it did tell me that somebody wanted to enter. So here I'm admitting someone else. Okay. So um, we had 14 members participate in our sale getting 215 trees and shrubs out into the communities. That's so exciting. Um, we also are purchasing over $2,800 worth of locally sustainably grown, responsibly grown plants at a local nursery. And I don't know about you, but I wanna give my money to people who are doing things the right way. So that makes me really happy. Um, the most popular plant ordered was the Grow Low Fragrant Sumac, just in case you were wondering. So um, this shrub makes a great ground cover or a shorter shrub to replace Japanese barberry or burning bush. And it has that amazing fall color and those great berries that wildlife love. So I thought that was a fun little, I wasn't exactly uh, thinking that that was going to be the most popular, but it was. And I think we um, actually bought them out. So not to brag, but. <laughs> uh, last month, all of the members received a survey monkey so that we could try and figure out what you wanted from our chapter. 26 members filled it out. Thank you so much. Thanks for your feedback. It really helps us. Uh, one of the questions was, how did you find out about Wild Ones? Because we want to try and be reaching people where they're going for information. So some people learned uh, about us on Facebook, some from the Master Gardeners of Delaware County. Some were on another um, naturals or pollinator website, and it, linked, it listed Wild Ones as an organization to look for. In fact, I found Wild Ones from I think a Facebook group last year and then looked for a local chapter. And that's how this chapter got started because we didn't have a local chapter. Um, and somebody thought maybe it was the School Kill Nature Center that they had heard about us from. So it sounds like word is getting out there about us. People are trying to find us. The second question was your knowledge level. And as you can see about 20% are beginners and 20% are experts and the other 60% are along with the rest of us. We know some, but we're trying to learn more. And that's what we hope to, we, we wanna meet everybody's needs, but we hope to really hone in on that, um, getting everybody to that comfort zone, at least in the middle where you can play with things because you've learned enough that you can, you know, match a few plants together and make a few good communities. Um, talking about what you want the chapter to, to provide you with. This is what it looked like. Um, most people want us to do everything and I love that. I think that was like all of the options I gave them and they want that all. So that's really exciting. The In the others category, some of the things that people want us to do, I'm 100% behind. They want us to be um, an outreach and help spread the word in the communities to educate is part of our mission. I completely agree. Um, they want us to help with the ability to convince communities about the importance of using native plants. Yes, agree. Offer plant sales so others can add trees and shrubs that are beneficial to both birds and pollinators and educate regarding not removing leaves from their properties. So. Our first plant sale was only for members, but in the future, if we want to think about things like um, using our group as a way to make bulk purchases and then sell them for fundraising purposes and to get native plants just a little bit easier to acquire, that is definitely something we can think about doing in the future. Um, support in making native plants part of my area's corporate and municipal land management policies concerning urban development, urban areas. That's actually, along with HOAs, one of our um, midterm goals for the chapter to help people make these changes and educate their open space communities. 
and somebody reached they said so with the survey monkey i wasn't able to see who wrote what so if whoever wrote this comment is on tonight and is um, interested in touching base they said they're considering co-founding or at least helping others to start a western pennsylvania chapter so i think that would be great and i'd be more than happy to talk with you about the steps that i took uh to get this going so just reach out to me then just know that i i don't know who you are i'm sorry survey monkey doesn't tell me and that brings us to the thought of the month um, Lindy is going to unmute and she's going to read our thought of the month. All right, can you hear me? Um, speak a little closer to your mic, maybe. Is this better? That's better. Okay, perfect. So this month we are thinking of spring ephemerals. Ephemeral is an adjective originally meaning lasting but one day. Later, the meaning was extended to include transitory. Edge of the Woods Nursery defines spring ephemerals as the first plants to pop up in spring and the first to flower. They emerge early to take advantage of the sunlight that penetrates the bare branches of the deciduous woodland. Prairie Nursery tells us that they have special value for early pollinators at a time when food sources are scarce. After they finish blooming, the foliage of ephemerals dies back and the plants are dormant until the following spring. When you hear the words spring flowers, what is the first image that comes to mind? Do you think of daffodils, tulips, hyacinths? Although beautiful and fragrant, these spring flowers are not native. Let's try again. When you hear the words native spring ephemerals, what comes to mind? We have so many beautiful native ephemerals and we encourage you to check them all out. Edge of the Woods Nursery has a good article and list of spring ephemerals on their website. And another quick thought, with spring comes cleanup. Please keep the insects in mind when tidying up the garden. Many insects overwinter in last year's plant stems and under leaf litter. Some of these insects are a primary food source for the birds in spring. If you must remove the stems and leaves, consider placing them in a pile somewhere in your yard where they won't be disturbed. Awesome, thank you so much, Lindy. And thank you, Audrey, for that great thought of the month. Can you guys hear the little chicks chirping beside me? <laughs> They're like trying to escape. Um, so if I like run off screen, it's because I've got chickens running around my kitchen. Okay, so we are so fortunate to have one of our members, Michelle, um, tonight to talk to us about pollinator pathways. And I just need to make sure that I have Michelle on. It looks like I don't see her yet. I wonder if she got held up. Well, I can tell you the tiny bit that I know until she gets here. Um, she, it looks like you take simple steps to be on the pathway. You plant native plants for habitat and stormwater management. You remove non-native invasive species over time and replace them with native plants. You avoid using pesticides and synthetic fertilizers and you leave winter habitat for pollinators, meaning the leaves and the stems. I'm sure there's a lot more information that she's gonna provide in her presentation if and when she is able to join us tonight. Hopefully she's all right, um, but something probably came up unavoidable. So we will Look, you'll get a kick out of this. This is when we were going to share Michelle's screen. And um, so last month we had an amazing presenter. And in fact, every month we've had really great presentations. And um, this month we, I should say, how many of you were able to participate in the Doug Tallamy um, the Nature of Oaks presentation. The link was shared last week. Um, did anybody get to see that? No? Yes, I see one head shake. Wait, let me scroll. Anybody else, you guys? Yeah, Judy got to see it. Great. Judy found a thumbs up. That's awesome. I don't know how to do that. Okay. So, um, I will try and share a link of the recording with you if you didn't get to see it. It's probably discoverable on 
um, YouTube also. I went out and picked up the book today. Uh, so I'm excited to read that. When, when I watched the presentation, I kind of thought, I've seen a lot of Doug's presentations. They're always great. But what really is he going to be able to um, talk about that I haven't heard in his other presentations? Don't miss it. It really is great. He shares a, even more information. It, it's very well done. I highly recommend it. But um, going back to the kind of source of what inspired me to really want to get this chapter off the ground was Doug Tallamy's Bringing Nature Home book. And right before the pandemic shut everything down, I got to see him give his Nature's Best Hope presentation. And that really spurred me to actually start the chapter. So last month, Bowman's Hill Wildflower Preserve had Doug Tallamy as one of their uh, one of their winter lecture series presentations. And we're fortunate enough to have that presentation to watch tonight for anybody who didn't get to see it. They're also having um, a next virtual speaker series on Thursday nights. It's called Thursday Night Nature. It begins tomorrow night. Um, these are one hour lectures that take place on Thursday evenings from 7 to 8 p.m. They are over Zoom. You do have to register. Uh, so if you're interested in that, get on the Bowman's Hill Wildflower Preserve website and check that out. But I am going to bring up the other. Hmm. You can definitely hear the chicks. <laughs> you, yeah, they're getting loud now. Um, let me do this. Escape. I want escape from there. And we are going to listen to Doug Tallamy's Nature's Best Hope presentation and just be inspired all over again by all of the things that he has to teach us. And then at the end of the presentation, um, we're going to talk about some upcoming opportunities in our communities and some other things that we have planned. So uh, grab a cold drink and listen to really my inspiration. It is my absolute honor and pleasure to introduce. Yeah. There we go. Today's speaker, Dr. Doug Tallamy who's professor in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware. He has authored 104 research publications and has taught insect-related courses for nearly 40 years. Chief among his research goals is to better understand the many ways insects interact with plants and how such interactions determine the diversity of animal communities. His book, Bringing Nature Home, how Native Plants Sustain Wildlife in Our Gardens was awarded the 2008 Silver Medal by Garden Writers Association. He's co-authored The Living Landscape with Rick Dark, and his new book, Nature's Best Hope, was a New York Times bestseller. His awards include the Garden Club of America's Margaret Douglas Medal for Conservation and the Tom Dodd Jr. Award of Excellence, the 2018 AHS B.Y. Morrison Communication Award, and the 2019 Cynthia Westcott Scientific Writing Award. Um, I know I have absolutely loved the books of his that I have read, and I know that many of you have as well. Jesse, I think you have to unmute. Um, not this fall, but the previous fall, a year ago. Thank you. Uh, we had what we call an oak mast. All of the members of the Red Oak group got together and decided to make their acorns at the same time. And this is what it looked like in a lot of places. 
well, I'm easily entertained. So I took one of those acorns and I stared at it and I was rewarded because an insect started to chew its way out of the acorn. First it chewed a hole for its head, forced its head through, and then it forced the rest of its body through that little hole. It was a tight squeeze, made him look like the Pillsbury Doughboy. Finally, it plopped down though, then that is a very dangerous time for this insect larva because it is good to eat. A lot of things are after it. So it gets to safety by wiggling and squirming below the ground in about 30 seconds. And once it's underground, it stretches in all directions and forms a chamber. And then within that chamber, it converts itself into a cocoon. It stays there for two years. After two years comes out as an acorn weevil. Now, a lot of people think weevils have big noses because it certainly looks like they do, but that's actually an extension of the head capsule and the mouth parts are way down here. They take those mouth parts and they chew a hole down into the center of the acorn Turn around, lay an egg in that hole, and that's how the larva gets to the center of the acorn. You might wonder why they spend two years underground. Why don't they come out the next year, like most insects do? Well, it takes uh, red oak acorns 18 months to complete the development. So if they came out the very next year, there wouldn't be enough acorns for those weevils. That, of course, leaves a hole in the acorn. Uh, they drew vacuum, and Peter Major pours a vacuum, and in this case, she has filled it with three species of temnothorax ants, tiny little ants whose entire colony lives in the vacated holes made by acorn weevils and acorns. And if they discover a new acorn, um, their old acorns falling apart. So they get very excited. They want to move their, their colony in. So they tell everybody there's a new house and then they start to move all the larvae and the eggs and the queen. And that takes about 30 minutes, but then they're totally moved into their new house. They post a guard at the door here to make sure nobody else comes in. Uh, and that's where they live for the next next two years. Now, at this point, my wife says, what's your point? What are you trying to tell us? I'm trying to tell you, that's just one of literally millions of very specialized interactions that overfits most of nature. This is another one, the relationship between jays and, and uh, oaks. Jays are the primary disperser of, of oak acorns. They can take an uh, acorn and then fly uh, as far as two miles away. Then they tap it below the surface of the ground. The object is, is to, uh, they're, they're storing their food for the winter and then they're gonna go find it again. But Jay's memory is not perfect. So there's a lot of those acorns they never see again, which means each single Jay ends up planting uh, a couple thousand oak trees every single fall. Found out this fall, what is really pollinating are witch hazels. Uh, if you read in the books, they'll say, oh, it's a little flies and fungus gnats. And every time I look at a witch hazel flower, I never see anything on there. But if you go out at night, uh, there's a group of moths called winter moths, a uh, number of species of sallows. This is the bicolor sallow. Uh, and they fly very late, too. I caught a bicolor sallow on Christmas Eve this year. Uh, so they turn out to be the primary pollinators of witch hazel. And I don't know whether witch hazel is blooming late to take advantage of winter moths or whether winter moths are flying late to take advantage of witch hazel. But at this point, they depend on each other. You won't have breeding pileated woodpeckers anywhere near you if you don't have lots of carpenter ants because that is what they rear their young on. And you won't have carpenter ants unless you have the, the large trees that make carpenter ants. You won't have this bee, Andrena faciliae, unless you have this plant, Facilia. That is the only pollen that that bee can rear its young on. And it turns out that pollen specialization is very common in our native bees. We have about 4,000 species of native bees and well over a third of them can only reproduce on the pollen of particular example, around here, there's only there's about 13 species of bees that can only reproduce on perennial sunflowers. You won't have Baltimore checker spots unless you have white turtle head. On and on and on. Nature truly is a series of specialized relationships. Today, though, these relationships, nature itself is on the ropes. It's on the ropes because we did not take Teddy Roosevelt's advice. Back in 1908, Teddy uh, heard that the state of Arizona was going to mine the Grand Canyon. So he went to the canyon looked out over the edge and said, leave it as it is. And with those five words, he started the process of creating the Grand Canyon National Park. The problem, of course, is that today, uh, leaving it as it was is no longer an option because we didn't do that. It's only about 5% of the lower 48 states. It's anything close to its original pristine ecological condition. And that's because we have logged the country repeatedly. We have tilled it. We have drained it. We have raised it. 770 million acres of, of rangeland uh, in the U.S., which is four and a half times the size of Texas. And of course, we named it and otherwise developed it. We straightened our rivers and dammed them. And you can spell that any way you want. We have 
polluted our skies and changed our climate for centuries to come. We've drained our aquifers. We've introduced more than 3,300 species of plants from other continents, many of which are running amok in our, our natural areas. In short, we've carved up the natural world into tiny remnants of its former self. And each one of those remnants is too small and too isolated from other such remnants to sustain the species that run the ecosystems that we all depend on. You might wonder why we've done this. I wonder why we've done this sometimes. I guess we just thought the earth was so big that, you know, our nest was so big, we could foul it forever and there wouldn't be any consequences. But we were wrong about that. And uh, we're seeing headlines to remind us of that at a pretty regular clip now. Like the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on earth? Talking about global insect decline. Or this one, North America's lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. That's a third of our North American bird population gone. Followed by this one. The UN now says uh, a million species are likely to go extinct in the next 20 years. And I love the way they report these headlines, uh, uh, you know, as if it doesn't matter. They might as well say uh, we're going to lose oxygen in the next 20 years and then go on to the next headline. Uh, this is not an option, folks. It is simply not an option to lose a million species. So I could go on uh, talking about the pox that we humans have delivered upon the environment, this upon all of our houses. But that's not what this talk is about. This talk is about a cure for that pox. It would take small efforts from lots of people, but they would deliver enormous physical, psychological, and environmental benefits to everybody. Let's return to this headline briefly. The insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Well, the great E.O. Wilson, Harvard Emeritus, um, the most famous entomologist uh, ever told us what it would mean if we lost insects. And he did it way back in 1987 in this paper, The Little Things That Run the World. And his message was very clear. Life as we know it depends on insects. And if they were to disappear, so would most of our flowering plants. And if most of our flowering plants disappeared, that would so drastically change energy flow through our terrestrial habitats that the food webs that support our animals, the amphibians, the reptiles, the birds, the mammals, and even many of our freshwater fish, those food webs would collapse and those animals would disappear. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth would rot because we would have lost insect decomposers that right now rapidly turn over nutrients and all we would have is, is uh, bacteria and fungi. And of course, humans would not survive any of those drastic changes. Good news is it doesn't have to happen. We can save our insects, we can save our birds, we can save nature itself, but we're gonna have to change the way we landscape to do it. Why do we need to do it? Well, remember, humans are products of nature. We are totally dependent on functioning ecosystems. So many, so many of us think we're independent of the natural world. That just doesn't matter. But that nothing is farther from the truth. Here are some of the things that plants produce that we desperately need. People say they produce them for humans. They produce them for everything, like oxygen. Pretty important. They clean our water and and. and on the, the land longer before it gets to the sea where it's too salty. Carbon capture is an enormously important ecosystem service today. It's plants that are pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, taking the carbon from that molecule and building their, their tissues from it, and then pumping the extra carbon that they pull out of the atmosphere into the ground. They've been doing this 24-7. Yet, you know, our, our soils are brown or black because of the carbon that plants have deposited in there. Uh, soil scientists now tell us that the earth soils can sequester seven times the amount of carbon that's in the atmosphere right now. If you want to end climate change, get the carbon out of the air into the ground. Who does that? Plants. They build topsoil. They hold it in place. They prevent floods. They dampen severe weather. All kinds of important things. What do animals do for plants? They provide pest control services. They pollinate nearly 90% of our flowering plants. They disperse plant seeds and so on. So designing landscapes like this that destroy the production of ecosystem services, uh, it's just a, a really bad idea these days. It never was a good idea, but you know we have 7.8, 7.9 billion people on the planet right now, uh, which is more than ever before. So we need more ecosystem services now uh, than ever. We cannot afford to waste huge portions of the earth in areas that are ecologically dead. Through the ages, who have recognized that we humans needed to work on our relationship with planet Earth. And Aldo Leopold was one of the most eloquent, he wrote extensively in the uh, first part of the 1900s. One of the things he said is the oldest task in human history is to live in a piece of land without spoiling it. 
Now, there have been indigenous groups that have been uh, good at doing that. Uh, you know, our large Western societies and our large uh, Asian uh, societies are terrible at doing that. It's never been a focus. We are great at, at extracting more from a particular area than the earth has to offer, completely wrecking it, going to another place, doing the same thing. And all those, so that's, that is not a sustainable relationship with the earth. So he had, he had this, uh, like a dream, you know, that we were actually capable of developing what he called a land ethic. He knew we had to use the earth. We had to farm it and live our trees and do all of those things. But he dreamt that we were actually capable of doing, learning how to do those things gently without destroying local ecosystems. And that's what he called his land ethic. And he talked about that in the Sand County Almanac. What he did not talk about though, was developing a land ethic where we actually lived. And I'm not sure why, but I suspect the notion that humans and nature cannot coexist in the same place at the same time was so deeply embedded in, in Elder Leopold's uh, culture, so embedded in our own culture. So he may not have recognized it as a viable option. Uh, but what I want to argue this afternoon is that living with nature not only is an option, it is now the only viable option that's, that's left to us. You know, in the past, conservationists worked almost exclusively where there weren't a lot of people. We now need to turn that on its head. We need to save nature, actually reconstruct it, where we've dismantled it, where there are a lot of people, because that is most every place. Because we have to find ways for nature to thrive in human dominated landscapes, not hang on, but thrive. Where are we gonna start? Let's go back to private property. 85.6% of the US east of the Mississippi is privately owned. About 75% of the entire country is privately owned. If we don't do conservation on private property, we're gonna fail because we won't be working on a large enough uh, parcels of land to sustain the species that, that run our ecosystems. But there are a lot of options for conservation that uh, we haven't really taken advantage of. We haven't thought about them. Like power and pipeline rights of ways. We have 21 million acres in power and pipeline rights of ways. Some are being used for conservation, but not, not much. Railroad rights are raised, uh, 3 million acres. Golf courses, 2 million acres. Airports, 3 million acres. The Denver airport is twice the size of Manhattan. These are huge areas. Another 17 million acres of roadsides, and then all the places we live, both in rural areas, in suburbia, in our cities, hundreds of millions of acres in those types of landscapes. If you add them up, that's that's 599 million acres. They could be much more effective in conservation than they to it. How big is 599 million acres? It's big. It's huge. Expanded Vermont, plus New Jersey, plus Maine, Virginia, New York, Georgia, Florida, plus Oklahoma, Montana, California, and even Texas. Not having a place to do conservation is not the issue. There are plenty of places we can do conservation. But what I'm really talking about when I use the word conservation is, is rebuilding uh, the natural world that we have dismantled where we humans have dominated it. And carefully because there are building block species that everything else depends on. So we have to make sure they're there. And then the other species that depend on those building blocks, we can add later on. So what are the building blocks? Well, we talked about those flowering plants, um, capturing so much of the energy and turning it into food. You're not gonna have them without the pollinators that, that allow those plants to, to reproduce. And once the plants uh, capture the energy from the sun and turn it into food and the leaves in their leaves now. If animals don't eat those leaves, it's it remains in the leaves and you don't have a viable food web. Most vertebrates do not eat plant leaves. They eat something that ate those plant leaves and that's something typically is insects and it turns out that caterpillars are transferring more energy from plants to, to other animals than any other type of plant eater which makes caterpillars essential components of terrestrial ecosystems. If we design landscapes that don't have a lot of caterpillars, most of the energy remain, remains locked up in the plants uh, and you don't have a viable ecosystem. Let's use the Carolina chickadee as an example. Uh, we have a lot of data on chickadees. Chickadees, of course, are, are at our feeders right now. When I started this talk, I looked out the window, there's, there's a chickadee. Seeds. So people think, well, that's what they need. And 50% and of their diet during the winter is seeds. But when they're reproducing, when they're making babies, their babies can't eat seeds. So they switch to insects. And most of those insects, it turns out, are, are, are caterpillars. If they have the option, they'll feed their young exclusively on caterpillars. And they are not exceptions. 96% of our terrestrial birds 
rear their young on insects. And again, most of those insects are caterpillars. How do I know that? There's a number of lines of evidence that, that uh, support that, but this is a citizen science project that one of my uh, recent graduate students, Ashley Kennedy, uh, recently finished. I had a call for uh, citizen scientists, for bird photographers across the country to take pictures of birds as they were bringing food to the nest. The object was for Ashley to identify the atoms that were in the beaks of the birds so she could reconstruct the nestling diet of as many birds as she as possible in this country and she got thousands of pictures from all over the country and she did do that what you're looking at the reconstructed nestling diets for 20 of the common bird, bird families in north america three bars are the percentage of those diets that are caterpillars and in 16 out of the 20 common bird families caterpillars dominated the diet so there's something special about caterpillars. Let's figure out what it is. Actually, there's several things that are special about caterpillars. And one of them is that they're, they're relatively soft prey atoms. Think of this guy as if he is a sausage with a very thin wrapper. The thin wrapper is exoskeleton. It's cuticle made of chitin. It's undigestible. And the birds don't want a lot of that. Because they're soft, you can stuff the caterpillar down the throat of your offspring without fear of injuring the, the esophagus. Uh, and if you ever watched a parent bird where they're young, they're pretty rough. Their beak is like a plunger. They just stuff it down there. Caterpillars are also relatively large prey items. One medium-sized caterpillar is equal to the biomass of 200 aphids. Now, some of our smaller birds do chase aphids around. If you want to chase 200 aphids or get one caterpillar, they're nutritious. They're very high in fat, very high in protein. Low percentage of chitin compared to uh, most other insects, particularly beetles. Beetles are not like little sausages. They're like little tanks. <laughs> Much of a beetle is undigestible, and a lot of beetles have, have uh, very sharp edges. And it turns out the caterpillars are the best source of carotenoids for birds during the breeding season. Now, I mentioned carotenoids not because I love organic chemistry, but because I'm a vertebrate. And you're a vertebrate. And your birds are vertebrates, and we vertebrates cannot make our own carotenoids. We only get them from plants. Only plants make carotenoids. And we only get them from plants because carotenoids are essential components of vertebrate diets. That's why my wife Cindy makes sure I have lots of carrots to eat to get my beta carotene and lots of tomatoes to get my lycopene and whatever that is to get my lutein. Uh, and if I eat those things, it stimulates my immune system. And I can't think of a better time to have a, a healthy immune system. Carotenoids are antioxidants. They run around our body and protect our DNA from oxidative damage. They improve color vision. When your mother said, eat your carrots, you will see better. She was right improve sexual attractiveness, improve sperm vitality. Now I'm talking about uh, things like this prothonotary warbler male who's had access to lots of lots of lutines. He's taken those lutines and he has built pigments out of them, put them in his feathers, and the brighter he is, the more ladies he attracts. Where are they getting all their carotenoids from? From, of course, what, what they're eating. During the, the breeding season, it's all of these invertebrate prey items, but carotenoid content is not equal across these prey items. The first two bars here are types of caterpillars. They have far more carotenoids than other types of, of insects. The uh, third bar is orthopteroids, things like grasshoppers, crickets, and katydids. Here is the uh, adult caterpillars down here, the moths and butterflies. Uh, themselves have far fewer carotenoids because they're not eating green leaves then. That's where the carotenoids are. And here's the earthworm way down here. So the early bird gets the worm, but he doesn't get any carotenoids when he gets the worm. Does carotenoid content influence how birds hunt for food? Well, Ashley did another study with bluebirds. She put GoPro cameras on the, the roofs of bluebird boxes, and those cameras took a picture once every second. The object was to to uh, record the uh, get a picture of the bluebirds as they flew into the house with with uh, food in their beaks, uh, and then identify what the food is and see whether the the uh, frequency with which they brought back that particular type of prey um, had anything to do with the amount of carotenoids in that that prey. Well, she had a lot of bluebird boxes and a lot of GoPro cameras, and she did it for three years, so she had over a million pictures to go through. But out of the million pictures, she got 7,628 that were good enough where she could identify the prey item. Uh, and this is what she got, a very nice relationship. Caterpillars are brought back more often than anything else, no surprise there, and they have the highest level of carotenoids, followed by those orthopteroids that had the next highest level. And then everybody else with low levels of carotenoids uh, was nestled back here. 
So it does suggest that carotenoids might be important in prey choice, but it, what it really suggests is that caterpillars are probably not optional parts of bird diets. They're essential parts of bird diets. Birds need caterpillars. How many caterpillars do they need? Is one or two enough or one or two a day enough? Well, that's a good question. Let's go back to chickadees uh, again, because they're very well studied. How many caterpillars does it take to make a nest of, of chickadees? One or two is not enough. One or two a day is not enough. It takes thousands of caterpillars to make one clutch of, of a bird that's a third of the house. 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars, depending on the number of chicks in the nest. And that's just to get them to the point where they leave the nest. After they leave the nest, uh, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars for another 21 days. But they're flying all around, so nobody's been able to, to count them. So you're really talking about tens of thousands of caterpillars to make a new generation of, of chickadees. And that generation, they just just one nest full. And if you want chickadees breeding in your yard, and we do want them breeding in our yards because in so many places, that's all that's left is our yards. You have to have all those caterpillars in your yard because chickadees forage about 50 meters from the nest. They are not flying five miles down the road to the nearest woodland, and that is true for most birds. And if we landscape in a way that does not produce all those caterpillars, that's called insect decline. And it's really starting to look like insect decline is one of the major drivers of the birds' declines that are being reported. We went to the original data set of Rosenberg et al. The, the group that said we have lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. And we divided the terrestrial birds up into two, two groups. The uh, birds that require insects at some part of their life history, typically when they're breeding, and the bird species that do not require insects. Uh, things like uh, finches and doves that can reproduce off of seed. They actually gained uh, uh, some numbers during the last 50 years, but the species that require insects lost on average 10 million individuals per species. This doesn't prove cause and effect, but it certainly is suggestive that as insects go, so go birds which makes me think we need to start landscaping in a way that, that uh, creates caterpillar populations. So the birds have something to eat, and it's not just birds that eat caterpillars, it's lots of other things. So how do we landscape for caterpillars? Remember, this is, this is a different goal of landscaping. In the past we landscaped, we were convinced our plants were just decorations. We didn't want anything to eat them, so we landscaped in a way that would have no caterpillars, no insects, that was the goal. How do we turn that around? Well, you add caterpillars to your landscape by adding the plants that make, make them. That doesn't make any sense. There is a catch, though, and that is most plants don't make a lot of caterpillars. So we have to be fussy about which plants we're going to add to the landscape. Why do we have to be fussy? Because most of the caterpillars eating uh, plants are fussy, too. And the monarch butterfly illustrates it as well as anything else. You can have all the, all the calorie pear or, or bush honeysuckle or barberry or Boxwood, Japanese canthus, or any of the other ornamentals that we typically put in our yard from Asia. And you're not going to make a single monarch butterfly. The only thing that will support monarchs is milkweeds. Without milkweeds, no, no monarchs. That's because monarchs are, are host plant specialists, and it turns out most of the insects that are out there are host plant specialists, just like monarchs. Why is that? Because plants have made them specialized. Plants don't want to be eaten. They want to capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they've loaded their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals, secondary metabolic compounds that make those leaves either bitter or downright toxic. And it's a really effective defense that keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. If you don't believe me, this, this summer and this spring, go out and eat a plant. See if you like it. You're not going to like it. They're all really well protected. It's green out there in the summertime. It's not because there's no insects out there that want to eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat most of the plants. There's a reason it is hard to get our kids to eat their vegetables. It's because they inherently know that they're toxic. That's my little joke. It's not a joke, though. Um, insects do eat plants. We know that. So how do they do that? How do they get around all of those very, very fine defenses? Well, this is where the specialization comes in. Plant lineage that's out there has a unique cocktail of chemical defenses that's protecting it from, from insects. Uh, any, any one insect species cannot adapt to all of them. So they pick one or two and they get really good at getting around those one or two. But because they're focusing on those, they don't focus on any other plant lineage. So they get locked into eating those particular plants. They develop the, the enzymes that store and excrete and detoxify those nasty compounds. The behavioral adaptations, life history adaptations that minimize their exposure 
to those compounds. It takes a long period of evolutionary history for all those adaptations to fall into place. It does not happen overnight. And that is why when we bring in plants from other continents, insects can't eat them. Or if they do very, very little. That of course was the goal originally, bring in a plant nothing could eat and then it'd be a great decoration. But uh, if, if you do that everywhere, you've got, you've got dead landscapes. So what I'm trying to say here is that plant choice matters. If we're trying to rebuild the food webs that support the life around us, we have to choose the plants that are going to support the insects that do that. I'm going to give you three examples of how easy that actually is. Uh, starting with our house right here in Oxford, Pennsylvania. I am sitting in this window right now. Uh, we have 10 acres of a farm that was broken up a few years ago. Uh, it was a very old farm, been farmed for 300 years soil totally exhausted. The last thing they did was to mow the area for hay, uh, but the definition of hay is pretty loose around here. They're just giving it to the mushroom industry. They're really mowing the rootstocks of all the invasive plants that are here. Multiflora rose and oriental bittersweet and autumn olive and Japanese honeysuckle and privet and on and on and on. And then they mow that and call that hay. So when, when we built the house and they stopped mowing, this is what came back. You know, you've all seen it before. Most of our lands are, are terribly invaded with, with these uh, Asian ornaments. Cindy, and she's getting ready to get rid of all this stuff on 10 acres. If you have a, a base, an invasive problem and you probably can easily give up, you can get ahead of it. Cindy has, she's done it, um, and she did it largely by herself. What was I doing while she was working hard? I was telling her she was doing a great job, uh, but I also was putting plants back. Uh, you can't just, you can't just, well, we'll talk about that let it go and, and, and selectively take out the bad guys as they come in. But I was actively putting in plants, trying to rebuild the biodiversity in our house. Uh, at our house. And I focused on plants I knew would bring in, or I hoped would bring in caterpillar species that drive the food web here. I wanted to see if I could get the Canadian outlet. I'd never even seen a Canadian outlet. Uh, this is what a Canadian outlet looks like. That's what the adult looks like, just like uh, a leaf. But you can't have Canadian outlets unless you have meadow root. Plant, they will, they will eat. It's like the monarch, it's a host plant specialist. We didn't have any meadow root. I don't know if there's any meadow root around here. Um, the, the entire area was farmed for us. So the meadow root is long gone. So I got some meadow root from some, some other place, I don't know where. Uh, got the seeds, planted it, grew very nicely. But, you know, I, this was early on. I did not expect the Canadian elves to be able to find my little patch of meadow root very quickly, if at all. So I didn't go out and check it. It's over a month before I finally walked by. The meadow was almost defoliated by the Canadian Alice that had found it right away. Um, I was really surprised. But now, so that worked really well. Now we have a good population of meadow and a good population of Canadian Alice. So we've added two species to the property. Same story with the goldenrod stowaway. That's a misnomer, by the way. It has nothing to do with goldenrod. Uh, it is a specialist on this plant, Biden's Aristosa. Ditch it easy. I did know where there was some Biden's in a power away. So I got I got uh, some seeds, planted them, they grew really nicely. This took about a year for the goldenrod stowaway to find my uh, my Biden's Aristosa, but they did. We have a good population of both now. So uh, so there we go. I've added four species to the property. I wanted the Hackberry Emperor to come colonize our house, but as its name suggests, this this butterfly you know, is not the prettiest butterfly, but it's still part of the, the fauna that should be here. Hackberry. We didn't have any hackberry, so I planted hackberry. Uh, we had to wait three, four years for the uh, hackberry emperor to find our hackberry. But they did. Um, I bought one of my, my hackberry trees this June. On a single band branch, there were nine hackberry emperor caterpillar. Hackberry emperor butterfly caterpillar. So um, another big success. So we've added six species. That plant goldenrod came in on its own, and along with it came many of the things that eat goldenrod, like the beautiful meadow root and millet, the arcidra flower moth, the goldenrod leaf liner, the distinct sparaganothus, the goldenrod gall moth. Now, this is what I'm waiting for the goldenrod flower moth. I don't know why it hasn't found our, our goldenrod, but it has. It. So, this is uh, that's what the caterpillars look like. This is anticipation. This is part of the fun. This is like waiting for the ketchup to come out of the bottle. Every year, I check my goldenrod. Looking for the goldenrod flower moth. One of these years, I will find it, and that'll be a great day. And a Virginia creeper. Yes, Virginia creeper. It is a great name for it. If you climb our 
trees without strangling them, without girdling them. It has good fall color, and it's it's the primary host plant of a number of sphinx moths that are the primary nestling diet for our cardinals. Things like the Pandora sphinx and its beautiful adult, the lettered sphinx, the hog sphinx, the abbot sphinx, all on Virginia creeper. Zebra swallowtail, I, I, you know, we're at the northernmost limit of zebra swallowtail populations. As a matter of fact, the northernmost one I know about is 26 miles south of us along the Susquehanna River. Um, and I didn't know whether we'd be able to attract it up, up here. Tails, of course, are pawpaws specialists. We didn't have any pawpaw, so we planted pawpaw. And then we waited. We had to wait. We waited nine years for the zebra swallowtail to finally find our pawpaws, but they have found it. In the meantime, we got the pawpaw sphinx. I didn't know there was a pawpaw sphinx. And we got lots of pawpaws. Wanted to get the double tooth prominent because it's such a cool looking caterpillar. It's a specialist on native elm, so I planted American elm. It came right away. Uh, one of the evening primrose moth because it's beautiful. I like beauty like anybody else. So we planted evening primrose and we were rewarded. The moth comes and, and sits with its head stepped in the flower during the day. It's very cute. And we planted lots of oaks. And these are just examples of the plants we've we put on our property. I want to focus on oaks for a while though, because they are such important plants. This is the Bedford oak in Bedford, New York. Uh, it, people argue about whether it's 400 years old or 500 years old. It is enormous. And, you know, a lot of people say, I don't, I'm not going to plant an oak because I won't live long enough to enjoy it. Enjoy what your oak is doing for you. It's doing for your your local ecosystem. You can enjoy it immediately. And I can say that with confidence because I planted most of my oaks as acorns or as two foot bare root whips. Acorns free, bare root whips dollar fifty each. And immediately they started to bring in, the, particularly the moths that support the food webs that support all of our birds and, and so many other things like the solitary oak leaf miner. Juvenile's dusky wing, the yellow shouldered moth, the orange headed epicolema, the red washed caterpillar, the yellow vested moth, the orange tufted oneida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red humped bookworm, the orange humped bookworm, the pink striped bookworm, the delightful dagger moth, the pleasant dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the streaked dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the brown bucalatrix, the white blotch heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the red black caterpillar, the red black caterpillar, literally hundreds more species of moths have come to the oaks on our property. Even the Bernie Mean caterpillar has, has come. Um, these guys are active during the winter time because they wear gloves. And they come right away. This is a pin oak that has popped its head above the, the leaves. And here's a crocus geometer standing on the ground eating the leaves of that, that little, little tree. So you don't have to wait centuries for your oaks to start to contribute. They contribute right away. This is a picture of our property uh, as it looks during the summertime these days. I'm still sitting in this, this window right there. Uh, this is to convince you that, uh, yes, we have lawn, but we're, we're healthy. But we put a lot of plants back, and those plants have brought life to, to our yard. Four years ago, I made it a, a goal to take a, a, a photograph of every species of lawn we could find on the property. I haven't gotten to the butterflies yet, so just the moths. I am up to 1,031 species of moths. It's more species of moths on our 10 acre than all the species of birds in all of North America. So we have 10 acres, but Pennsylvania is 2.4 million acres. So on one 240 thousandths of the land mass, we have 40% of all the moss species that occur in Pennsylvania. And because so many of these are, uh, are species that support birds and bird food, we've recorded 59 species of birds, terrestrial birds that have bred on We saw this headline this fall, World Wildlife Fund says that two thirds of the wildlife from planet Earth have vanished since 1970. Pretty depressing headline, but I'm thinking not at our house. I, I would wager that we have increased biodiversity by more than two thirds and it didn't take that long to do it. So um, I'm telling you these stories um, to encourage you. We can turn, our, turn these terrible headlines around simply start putting the plants that support the life around us back into our yards. But I know what you're thinking, we have 10 acres and maybe you just live in, in a little plot in suburbia. Will it work on smaller pieces of land? That's a good question. So let's go to Margie and Dan Terpstra's house in Kirkwood, Missouri. Uh, they live in a typical development. You can't tell from that here, but uh, they're surrounded by all their neighbors that have, have 
0.6 acres, 18 times less land than, than what Cindy and I have. Well, in Kirkwood, Missouri, the major invasive plant is, is Amur honeysuckle, bush honeysuckle. So the first thing they did was get rid of that. Then they planted a lot of native plant species. They put in a, uh, a water feature they call a bubbler. And then they sat back and started to count the birds that were using their yard. They are up to 149 bird species uh, that they, they, they photograph and that, that are using their yard, including 35 warbler species. Now we've only recorded eight warbler species on our, our 10 acres. Uh, so does it work on, on smaller properties? Absolutely. What about city yards though? Let's go to Pam Carlson house in Chicago. Uh, and I do mean in Chicago because right over this wall here is uh, one of the runways for O'Hare Airport. Right over here is Kennedy Expressway. Pam Carlson has one tenth of an acre. That is three times smaller than the average lot size in, in North America. And she is not connected to any type of greenway, any type of, of uh, preserved area. So she's a little island in Chicago. But she did the same thing. She took out her invasive plants. She put in 60 species of native plants, a water feature for the birds. And then she sat back and started to count the birds using her yard. She's up to 117 species of birds, including a woodcock. There's Pam's woodcock. So if you haven't seen a woodcock lately, go to Pam's house. But what about city centers? 82% of us live right in cities. Well, I, uh, 2014, I was staring at this plant, Asclepias tuberosa, butterfly weed. But that reminds me uh, that we have a marketing issue with our native plants. We call them weeds and wonder why people don't, don't plant them. So, um, so let's not call this butterfly weed anymore. It's not a weed. Let's call it Monarch's Delight. Okay, I was staring at Monarch's Delight in 2014, and the first thing I saw were two species of leafcutter bee, Megachylid bee. I know they are leafcutter bees because they carry their pollen on their tummy, not on their, their legs. Well, leafcutter bees have, have very strict requirements. Not only do they need pollen and nectar, but they need, um, they need soft leaves. Leaves from red buds are ideal, for example because they, they snip out the edges of those leaves into little semicircles. You, you might have seen this on your red bed. Roll them up into tubes, stuff them full of pollen, lay an egg on, on those tubes, and then uh, stuff that whole package into a crack or a crevice. This is what it looks like here. Three packages in a row stuck, stuffed into a tubular crevice. It's a picture by, by Heather Holm. Um, and that's how leafcutter bees reproduce. Well, there was a red bud right next to Monarch's Delight, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that is why leafcutter bees were there. I'm also pretty sure that's why bumblebees were there successfully. Uh, remember, bumblebees overwinter as queens. So in the spring, when they come out, every bumblebee you see early in the spring is a queen. She's got to start the colony entirely by herself, and it's hard to do that. She has no work or support. So when you have a lot of, uh, you know, abundant um, supply of forage of flowers for queen bumblebees early in the spring, it ups their chances of succeeding a lot. And that's exactly what redbud supplies. So I'm pretty sure that's why there were bumblebees there. And then I saw a monarch, actually saw two monarchs foraging on Monarch's Delight. This was exciting to me. This was 2014. I had gone uh, all of 2013 without seeing a single monarch. Very depressing. 2013 was the low point of the monarch population in the east. Only 3.6% of the monarchs left compared to 1976. <clears throat> and this was June. So it was early on to see monarchs this far, far north. Um, so, you know, maybe we weren't going to lose the monarch after all. That was very encouraging. Why were they there? Well, they had monarchs delight, but they also had another species of milkweed. I think this is purple milkweed. So they had, uh, they had nectar, but they also had their host plant. They could reproduce. Do you know where I was? I was on the High Line in the middle of Manhattan. On the High Line, 30 feet above the taxis, right in the middle of, of construction, right in the middle of millions of people. The High Line is a tourist destination now. Uh, it was an abandoned uh, elevated railroad, but uh, they, they, somebody went up and looked around. There were a lot of native plants up there, so they decided to turn it into a tourist destination. It's not 100% native, but it's largely native. And this is the amount of nature that's there. It's a strip three feet wide that follows the length of the, of the High Line, which is, I think it's up to a mile now. This is Rick Dark standing right here. Where's my pointer? He, uh, he was after me to go see the beautiful plants on the High Line for a long time. I'm not much of a city boy, so I, I dragged my feet. Uh, and, and, you know, going to see beautiful plants, to me, if, if those plants have nothing using them, that's actually depressing to me. 
that's a sign of loss rather than a sign of, of gain. And that's what I thought I would see on the High Line. I mean, who's going to colonize the middle of Manhattan like this? But I got there and within the 20 minutes that I was there, I saw everything I just, just saw. I'm sure I would have seen a lot more if I was there longer. Somebody's just finished a, a study of the bees using the High Line now. They're up to 30 species. So I was completely wrong. Things have found the plantings on, on the High Line, uh, which tells me that, that, you know, with thoughtful native plantings can bring back life to the middle of Manhattan, we can we can succeed anywhere. But there are four things we need to think about if we want to succeed in a big way. And one of them is we need to shrink the area that we have in lawn because we've got over 40 million acres of lawn, which is the size of New England. Uh, and lawn, of course, is, is exactly what I'm talking about when I say we can't afford to, to waste the earth anymore. This is a lot of area that is ecologically dead. It is functioning as a status symbol and I understand that we humans need our status symbols. But um, we can have a status symbol that's smaller. Let's cut the area of lawn in half. We'll still manicure the area we have. We can still be good citizens, but we're going to put plants in the, the, other, uh, the other half. And if we cut the area of lawn in half by planting uh, other plants, we can create a new national park that'll be 20 million acres in size. And if we do this at home, we can call it Homegrown National Park. And it'll be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, plus the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoke Mountains. And all those parks, still less than 20 million acres. So our, our Homegrown National Park will be the biggest park in the country. Uh, what do we get when we, when we build a park at home? You get the opportunity to develop a personal relationship with, with some aspect of nature right in your own yard, at your own time, your own pace. All you have to do is go outside. You can avoid crowds. You know, if you go to a real national park, there are millions of people there with you. Um, and that might, might not be your goal. It's free, there's no admission fee, and it's never closed. No matter what pandemic comes down the road, you can always go out into your own little park. No travel hassles. You get to experience the natural world alone. I don't know how you can develop that personal relationship with the natural world unless you're, you do it alone. But I particularly think it's important for our kids. Our kids, according to Richard Lube, are, are suffering from nature deficit disorder. So we're trying, we, we get 30 kids uh, with a teacher, put them on a bus and they, they drive for an hour and, and walk around a natural place for an hour. Teacher tells them not to touch anything. Then they get back in the bus and they go home and that's their experience with the natural world, which I'm sure is better than nothing. But it's really an experience with 30 other kids and a teacher telling them not to touch anything. If they have a park at home, they can go outside alone. No parental supervision. Let them risk it. Most of them will make it back alive. And it's so important that they develop this relationship because they are the future stewards of our planet. If they don't have a relationship with what they're stewarding, they're going to be lousy stewards. And they might even learn how to hunt lizards. Now I'm learning this from my own granddaughter, Zoe, who lives in Hawaii uh, on a very modest piece of, of the natural world. It's a lawn and a hedge. Uh, and it's tiny, it's about 10 by 10 square feet, but there are a no lizards there. And Zoe has discovered that you can hunt and know lizards as this is how you do it. You get on the ground, you cover yourself with sticks and, and uh, leaves so the lizards don't see you coming. Then you crawl very slowly towards the lizard. No smiling. This is serious business. You can wear your best dress. That's okay. But you sneak up on the lizard, you catch the lizard, you put it in an aquarium, and you've got that personal relationship with, with the lizard. Now, I, don't, I don't think Zoe's going to be on the ground in her best dress hunting lizards the rest of her life. I don't think. But I guarantee she's going to remember hunting lizards in Hawaii the rest of her life. And I also guarantee she's going to be a big, a good steward of the planet because of it. If you want your kids to do more than, than hunt lizards, uh, get this book, Nature Play at Home by Nancy Stranisti. It gives you dozens of examples of how to uh, get the kids out in the natural, right where they, right where they live. And if you want to join Homegrown National Park, go to our, our new um, website, homegrownnationalpark.org, and you can get yourself on the map. We're going to record your little piece of, of the, the, the world that you are restoring. You're, you're shrinking your lawn, you're putting in these native plants, so you're going to give us your, your 
location and the area that you are restoring or already have restored or are protecting. Uh, and your little piece of the world will, will light up. This is our attempt at um, using social media to actually reach beyond the choir. Maybe counties can compete with each other to see you know, which county has more people on the map. We already have over 4,000 people on the map, so we're off to a good start. Um, you know, the goal is to convert that 20 million acres, but why stop there? Let's, let's do the whole country. And you can even get a little sign, uh, put it in your yard. You belong to Homegrown National Park. By the way, it's free and no, we're not using your data for anything. Okay, we're gonna shrink the lawn. What are the plants we're gonna put in the area we take out of lawn? Some of them have to be what I'm calling keystone plants. Remember a Roman arch, the, the stone in the middle of the arch uh, is called the keystone. And if you take that stone out, the whole arch collapses. I'm calling these keystone plants because they are so important in producing food in our food webs that if we take them out of the food web, the food web collapses. That means all the animals depending on the food from those plants are gonna be gone. It turns out that just 5% of our native plants are making 75% of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs, 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs. So these are, if you're building, a, think of an analogy, you're building a house. These are the two by fours of that house. They're absolutely necessary to make that house stand up. You can't build a house out of, out of wallpaper. Although, you know, after the two by fours are there, you do wanna fill in the blanks with, with other plants, but these are the essential guys. The question no longer is simply, are natives better than, than non-natives? in terms of supporting wildlife. Uh, on average, they certainly are. Um, but there are a lot of natives that aren't all that that uh, productive. So the question really is, do we wanna focus on the most productive ones uh, or ones that are relatively benign or even worse, the plants that are actually destructive, the those invasive plants from Asia that don't stay in our yards or at least their offspring don't. The burning bush and the uh, you know, the calorie pear and the barberry and all of those guys that then then biologically pollute all the land around us, ecologically castrating it. Do we want to use those? Probably not. I get an email once in a while from somebody saying, don't you know the ginkgos, ginkgo biloba actually grew in North America. It's from Asia now. Grew in North America 7 million years ago. That makes them native. That means we can use them and everything will be great. Yes, I do know that ginkgos grew in North America 7 million years ago. We can argue about whether that makes them native today, but I'm not gonna have that argument because that's not the metric anymore. It's not whether they're native or not, it's whether they're doing anything or not, whether they're productive. I don't care whether ginkgos grew on the moon 7 million years ago. Today, they support zero species of caterpillars. Yes, I know there's two rare records of, of a caterpillar on a ginkgo. Um, I've never seen one, you're not gonna see one either. And either are the birds. What plants are producing the caterpillars that run our, our ecosystems? Well, in our area and in actually 84% of the counties of North America, it is Quercus, it is oaks. 557 species of caterpillars in the mid-Atlantic state supported by oaks, 557 species of bird food, over 900 species supported nationwide. There is no other plant genus that is uh, nearly as productive. Just to illustrate that, here's the power of keystone oaks uh, in, in our yard. Now, so far I've taken pictures of 1,031 moss species. I'm not done. Um, there's still more out there, but I, I ran out of warm weather. Um, out of that 1,031 species, 907 have known host plants. So there's still more than 100. I don't know what they're eating. Of the 907 species, 267 use oaks. We have 69 genera of native woody plants, woody plants on our property. Only one of those genera is, is Quercus, is oaks. And we have hundreds of genera of herbaceous plants. So oaks represent less than 1.5% of our woody plant diversity and way less than 1% of our total plant diversity. But they support at least 29%, almost 30% of our moss species diversity. So imagine what would happen if we took oaks out of the property. What would happen to the diversity and all the things that depend on the food they're producing? That's the role of a keystone plant. How do you find out what the keystone plants are where you are? You go to Native Plant Finder on National Wildlife Federation website. You put in your zip code and the ranked list of both woody and herbaceous plants will pop up for your county. Ranked in terms of the number of species of caterpillars that they support. Uh, so this is what a typical list in our area is gonna look like. Oaks will be number one, followed by uh, very, very closely by both native willows and native cherries. 
Um, blueberries are very high, birches are high, acers uh, are, are maples. Um, and notice I say native oaks, native cherries, native willow. If I go to the nursery and say, I want to buy a cherry, they're going to sell me a flowering Asian cherry. If I want to buy a willow, they'll sell me a weeping willow from Turkey. If I want to buy a birch, they'll sell me a European birch or a maple, a Japanese maple. You've got to specify that you want a native member of these genera. Because if you get na non-native members, it's going to reduce caterpillar use by 65%. We've done that experiment. Here are the top uh, herbaceous genera. The goldenrod's always way up there. The various genera of asters, our, our uh, perennial sunflower is very high. And just those three uh, groups of, of genera will support more than 40 species of specialist bees. Hundreds of species of caterpillars. There's 110 species of caterpillars on oaks alone. But uh, also the specialist bees use these plants very heavily. We want to plant for specialist bees because the generalists will use those plants as, as well. If you don't have those plants in your yard, that's 40 species of bees that won't be there as well. So, okay, we're going to shrink the lawn. We're going to put in keystone plants. We're going to attract a lot of uh, insects, particularly moths, to our yard. And then we're going to kill them with our security light. And that, of course, is not the goal. There's research from, from a lot of places, but particularly Europe, telling us that um, light pollution at night, the lights we have over our porches and our garages, um, that's light pollution. And it's, it's killing our insects in all these different ways. Through exhaustion, you know, the, the moth flies around and around till it drops, it, it collides with the light, it gets incinerated, dies of dehydration, the bat comes and picks it off. Bright lights blind uh, night uh, nocturnal insects. Uh, many of them, who knew? And it disrupts the th what they're supposed to be doing. So if this is a major cause of insect declines, and there's a lot of evidence that it is, I think it's really good news because it's so easy to reverse. Flick of a switch, turn out your light. What could be easier? But I know what you're going to say. Oh, I can't turn out my light because the bad man will come. Okay, put a motion sensor on your, your security light so it only turns on when the bad man does come. And the first thing you're going to find out is the Batman doesn't come very often. If you don't want to do that, take the white light out of your, your um, security light and put in a yellow bulb. Yellow wavelengths are far less uh, attractive to night, night insects than our white wavelengths. And yellow LED lights are the least attractive. If we switched out our, our white uh, night lights for yellow LED lights overnight, we would save billions of insects and billions of dollars because LEDs, of course, are far more energy efficient. All right, we're going to shrink our lawn. We're going to, to put in keystone plants. We're going to turn out our lights, and we're going to invite Mosquito Joe to come and kill all our insects. We have no, we're, we're very innovative in how to, how to kill insects. Uh, and I know what Mosquito Joe is going to tell you. This is a booming business around the country right now. Mosquito Joe is effectively undoing everything I've been talking about for the last 15 years. He says, well, this is a, a natural product, so it's okay. It is a natural product. It's pyrethroids uh, created from, from chrysanthemums. Uh, but cyanide is a natural product too, so I'm not sure that's a good argument. He also says it only kills mosquitoes. Not, not so, not even close to, to true. It kills everything it comes in contact with. The big thing is though, it's expensive and it doesn't work. You don't kill mosquitoes in the adult stage. You kill them in the larval stage. You have to kill 90% of the adult mosquitoes if you're going to control the population. Mosquito Joe kills around 10%. That, that study has been done over and over again. And that's why he has to keep coming back and back because it doesn't work. You control mosquitoes in the larval stage and you can do it right at home. Very simply, get a bucket, fill it full of water, put in some straw or hay and let it ferment for a couple of days. It becomes uh, irresistible to mosquitoes that want to lay their eggs. They lay their eggs right in that in that mixture there. Then you get a, a mosquito dung from the hardware store. Cheap. Uh, and you put one of these discs in the bucket. The mosquito eggs hatch. The larvae nibble on the mosquito dunk. And this is Bacillus thuringiensis. It's a, um, a bacterium that only kills aquatic diptera. And the only aquatic diptera in your bucket is mosquito. So it's it's very targeted. If a dragonfly gets in there, uh, or if, if your dog licks it, or if a bird drinks it, doesn't hurt them a bit. The only thing it hurts is mosquitoes. Uh, and it's cheap. So if everybody did this, we could actually control mosquitoes without killing everything else. All right, the fourth thing we need to do is to landscape in a way that allows caterpillars to complete their development. This turns out to be really, really important, and we're just starting to think about it. 
Uh, so in, in Chester County, there are 511 species of caterpillars that develop on oaks. A few of them, like the polyphemus moth, complete their development on, on the tree. The caterpillar eats the leaves, then it spins a cocoon and hangs, hangs from a branch, then it emerges as an adult and does it all again. Everything happens on the tree. I wish everything did that, but most, most of the caterpillars don't. 480 of those species, 94% drop from the tree. They wiggle uh, beneath the, the ground as mature larvae and pupate underground, or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter under the tree. And that's the problem. There is no leaf litter under the tree and the ground is mowed and trampled and compacted to the point where the caterpillar can't get underground. So this becomes an ecological trap. If these are keystone plants, the, the, uh, the moths come in, lay their eggs, caterpillars develop, and then they drop down and die. And the next generation is smaller, and the next generation after that is gone altogether. And let's face it, this is the way we landscape everywhere. I am convinced that this, along with light pollution, is another giant cause of insect declines. And of course, the cement landscape is even less of a viable option for caterpillars. I'm not trying to discourage the use of trees in, in cities trying to reduce the use of, of cement as, as a, uh, a default landscape. We know that's a bad idea. It destroys watersheds. Cement, by the way, is a major releaser of, of carbon dioxide, greenhouse gas. This is what most people do. You put a tree in the middle of a big lawn and nobody's measured what the, the survivorship of caterpillars in a situation like this is. Um, I wanted to do that this past summer, but Mr. COVID said no. Uh, but I guarantee it's going to be higher in a situation like this. We have a tree and then a layered landscape. Maybe a dogwood over here, then a, a native azalea and ferns and ground cover. Caterpillar drops down to a safe site. Nobody's going to mow it. Nobody's going to trample it. The ground is loose so it can get beneath the soil and pupate, or it can spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that's underneath there. Very high survivorship predicted in a situation like this. This is where you can do your spring ephemeral gardening. This is how you shrink your lawn. You put beds around your trees. No grass up to the trees. Beds, they're all safe sites. And this is where you can use your, your ground covers, your, your uh, wild ginger, um, your may apples, your foam flower, um, any of a number of, of ground covers, ferns. This is a, a hotel in Athens, Georgia. These are red maples. Any caterpillar developing in these red maples can, can drop down here, even though it's a busy hotel and it's a safe site and they can make it. Another grad student, Desiree Narengo, has done some, some wonderful work with chickadees in the suburbs of Washington, DC. She was looking at the um, ability of landscapes that are dominated by native plants to support chickadee populations over the long term versus landscapes dominated by non-native plants. And her results suggest there is room for compromise in our plant choices. So when the landscapes were dominated by introduced plants, they produced 75% fewer caterpillars. So the, the chickadee foods reduced by 75%. That can't be good. Those landscapes were 60% less likely to have breeding chickadees at all. They had nest boxes up, but the, the chickadees came and looked around and said, there's not enough food here. I'm not even going to try to reproduce. If they did try to reproduce, their nests contained 1.5 uh, fewer eggs. They were 29% less likely to survive at all. If they did survive, they produced 1.2 fewer fledglings and it took them 1.5 days longer to do that. If you put all of those numbers into a population growth model as a function of the percentage of non-native woody plant biomass in your yard, this is what you get from, from none to 100%. This dotted line is replacement rate. This is the rate at which the population has to make babies to replace the adults that die every year. Chickadees don't live that long. And if they reproduce at this rate, it's a sustainable population. It's not growing, but it's not shrinking either. If they make more babies than adults die, uh, it's a growing population. But if they make fewer babies, anything below the dotted line here, that's a shrinking, unsustainable population. Right here is where those lines generously uh, overlap, uh, which suggests you can have up to th about 30% of your woody plant biomass non-native. And as long as it's not invasive, so no calorie pairs, things like that, but you know, your forsythia and other things, as long as it's not invasive and doesn't dominate the landscape, you can have a sustainable food web that sustains breeding birds. In other words, 70% of your woody plant biomass should be native. But if you exceed 70% and, and, and where, where Desiree was working it, on average, it was 56% non-native. Where I live, it's 82% non-native. We've, we've measured it. Then you're way down here in the, in the curve and none of the landscapes around here are, are sustainable. 
Um, but this is the, uh, I'm excited about this for two reasons. This is the first time this has been measured for any bird anywhere. So if you doubt that your plant choice actually influences uh, what other things can live near your yard, check out this study. But this is the area of compromise that I'm excited about. You can have your ginkgo, you can have your crepe myrtle, you can have your boxwood, as long as they don't dominate your, your landscape. And that's good news to me because um, people love their, their non-native plants. And if I said you can't have any, I'd have very small audiences. Remember, it is not the presence of non-native plants that destroys food webs. It's the absence of native plants. So if we get the native plants into, into these landscapes, we can tolerate uh, some of our non-natives. Can we use native plants in formal designs? Of course we can. Somebody sent me this picture from North Carolina. Um, they're adding native plants to this very formal landscape here. They've added uh, Joe Pye. Notice I didn't call it Joe Pye weed. It is not a weed. And they're gonna send me another picture when they get a lot more species in here. Formality is a function of the design. It's not a function of the plants in the design. Our native plants are used in formal landscapes in, in Europe all the time. And I guess that's okay because they're non-native plants over there. Can we get a pollinator garden into a typical suburban yard like this without offending anybody? Of course we can, put a little fence around it. Look at all the species that are here, all the, all the species of native bees that will, um, will benefit from a little planting like this. It's not very big, uh, but um, if everybody did it, there'd be a lot more forage for our bees. You know, you hear all the time, we need pollinators because they pollinate our crops, 30% of our crops. It's actually about 12% of our, of our crops, but I think that's a terrible argument because um, people, you know, people who don't live next to a farm say, well, I'm not, I don't need pollinators here because I'm not next to a farm. We need pollinators because they pollinate 80% of, of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. If we don't have pollinators, we're gonna lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet. It's not an option, it's not an option. Where do we need these? Everywhere, everywhere where you want plants, not just next to farms. What about this? This is a Drew Latham design. It's much bigger than the, the previous one. It's still formalized. Imagine the amount of life that is here versus the amount of life that, that is here. Can municipalities help us live with nature? Of course they can, and more and more are doing it. I keep getting hearing more and more examples. Minnesota has a cost sharing program uh, that, that uh, will pay homeowners to replace some or all of their lawn with appropriate uh, Minnesota prairie plants. You get paid to do it, very successful. Pennsylvania, I just learned about this this week, has a lawn conversion program. You can get up to $5,000 per acre to help you convert your lawn to a, a uh, viable ecosystem. What a great program. Florida is, is paying, um, there's an a, uh, island off of Florida that has a lot of uh, burrowing owls and they're paying their residents to allow burrowing owls to burrow in the front yard. This is the way the Endangered Species Act should have been written with carrots rather than sticks. So you get paid to take care of the endangered species on your, on your yard rather than fined if you do something with your yard. Everybody would wanna do it. Missouri, Fayetteville, Arkansas have, have uh, bounties on calorie pairs. Take out a calorie pair and you get a free tree replacement. Even public utilities are getting into the act. In San Antonio, you get a hundred dollar coupon to replace uh, water thirsty non-natives with uh, water efficient native plants. Buffalo, New York's doing the same thing. I don't think it's anything to do with, with, with uh, water efficiency, but uh, it's just to get more natives in the landscape, get a hundred dollar coupon. And there's all those uh, more lawn conversion programs in the far west, California, $2 per square foot for every uh, bit of lawn you take out and replace with, with uh, appropriate xeric plantings. I think we've made three missteps in the early years of conservation. The first one is that um, even though we like nature, you know, we, we think it's important, we don't think it's essential. That's the misstep. I went to the Cincinnati Zoo in, uh, well, before the, the uh, virus broke out and there was this wall size poster there uh, which to me epitomizes what our society thinks of conservation. We wanna save wildlife so the future generations can enjoy it. That was Teddy Roosevelt's argument. We're gonna create the national parks so the future generations can see how splendid uh, nature can be. And I, and I get that, um, but it suggests nature is just there for entertainment. It's far more important than that. We need to save nature so that we have future generations. It's not just entertainment. No wonder we think it's, it's uh, not essential. We've also assumed that humans and nature cannot coexist. 
we talked about this, but if we restrict conservation efforts just to the areas where we don't have a lot of humans, we're going to fail because those areas are too small and too isolated from each other to sustain the species that run our ecosystem. David Quammen has a, a great analogy between a Persian rug and an ecosystem. That's a functional Persian rug. That is not 71 Persian rugs. That's 71 rug fragments, none of which are acting like a Persian rug. And that's exactly what we've done to our ecosystems. The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance. I hate that language because it suggests there are places on, on planet Earth uh, that don't have any ecological significance. Not so. Every square inch of the planet has ecological significance. Even our yards, even our corporate landscapes, even our roadsides. So let's glue our rug back together again. We've got to put the plants back in all those places we've taken them taken them out. We're not just building biological carters that connect these isolated fragments of, of viable habitat. We're going to create viable habitat where they don't exist right now. So plants and animals can actually live right where we are, where we live, where we work, where we where we play, and to a lesser extent where where we farm. And we're going to use a lot of those keystone plants that allow them to do that. Our third misstep was to leave Earth stewardship through just a few specialists, a few conservation biologists, few ecologists. We didn't see it as an inherent responsibility of every human being in the planet, but I have no idea why, because everybody on the planet depends entirely on the quality of Earth's ecosystems. So why wouldn't everybody have responsibility for good Earth stewardship? Makes no sense to me. Stan Rushworth, the Cherokee elder, once said that the Western settler mindset is I have rights. The mindset of, of indigenous people is I have obligations. You're not born with these mindsets, you're taught them. We're great at teaching, teaching this one, but we have been terrible at teaching our kids and our peers about their responsibility, their obligations towards Earth stewardship. It doesn't mean we have to save biodiversity for a living, but you can save it where you live. And I love this approach for exactly that reason. It empowers each one of us so many of us feel powerless today. The Earth's problems are huge, and, and it really does seem like one person can't, can't make a difference at all. But one person can go outside and plant an oak tree. One person can shrink the area they have in lawn, put in a pollinator garden, get rid of their invasive plants, and watch ecosystem life come back to their yard. One person. So the cliche works here. Um, you, one person can make a difference and see that difference. You become an important cog in the future wheel of conservation. And it also shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't worry about the entire planet's problems. You'll get depressed. Just worry about your piece of, of that planet, the piece you can manipulate. If you own property, it's obvious. That's where you, where you focus. If you don't own property, help somebody who does. Volunteer for, for a, uh, um, a park or a preserve a land conservancy, a botanical garden. Um, everybody's understaffed and, and, and underfunded, so they will love you. So as property owners or as volunteers, each one of us has, has the power. And we certainly have the responsibility to fix dead landscapes like this. Whether or not we decide to do so is going to determine nature's fate and ultimately our, our own fate. And I've convinced my grandchildren that you are nature's best hope. Hope I've convinced you as well. Thanks very much. Holy smokes. That was phenomenal. Um, thank you so much for, for that wonderful, wonderful presentation. I, uh, I think you get better and better every time I see you. So thank you. All right, guys, I am trying to get back to you. Let's see. Exit full screen. Come back. That was really just fabulous. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Is it not the best thing ever? And you wonder why I felt like my life was changed after I read Doug Tallamy. I, um, I want to go shopping right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Love it. I want to trying to do can you see me can anybody see me yes yes let's see i want to new share go back. oh you know what i need to do cancel go back here okay 
Okay, and then I need to do that. And now I have you back. Okay, I couldn't see anybody's faces. And now you're back. So um, for anybody who has never met Doug Tallamy before, um, he really is the reason why. Um, and his message is so hopeful and so possible that it makes me want to do it. You're right, Judy. I want to go out and buy, well, I mean, I want to buy plants every day anyways, um, but now I want to buy these plants. Um, I don't know how to follow that up. I, you can't really. So I'm just going to talk about some of our upcoming opportunities. Let me go into the present portion so you can see it a little better. One of our members um, shared with me this great publication by the um, Northern Chester County Sustainability Update, and it lists all of these great things that are happening this month. And uh, some give me ideas of things that I'm hoping as a chapter we might be able to do for next year's Earth Day. Maybe you can brainstorm some things you'd like to see happen and we can get together. Um, hopefully COVID isn't restricting group events and activities at that time, and we would be able to plan something for next year's Earth Day. But if any of these things are in your area or in your township, uh, just take a look at them and try and attend if you can. Some of them are online. There's a couple that are in person. I will send out the actual publication of this with the highlights of the meeting and the link for the recording so that there are some like clickable links and things. Uh, so you'll get to have that. There's actually a whole nother page of it. Phoenixville is very active and uh, there's just a lot of really great things. So this, you'll be able to see it on the recording, but also the PDF will allow you to click some things to be able to register for events. I was also excited to share with you last week I sent a link of all of the native plant nurseries that are, were having open houses or having events in person um, Keystone wildflowers you have to register for an appointment but on April 17th they are having an open house um, Bill there at Keystone wildflowers is wonderful very knowledgeable um, he's great to chat with and his property is beautiful the greenhouse is really great uh, Mount Cuba Center is having their wildflower weekend. Uh, you have to register, but it is in person. They're going to have a band and a food truck and be selling some natives. And if you've never been to Mount Cuba Center, it is magical, just magical. Um, so check that out. Also, I found out about this um, Lancaster Native Plant and Wildlife Festival. It is free. You do not have to pre-register. It's 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. Uh, it's in Lancaster, and I know we have several members that are from the Lancaster area, so I hope they get to go. I plan to go to this. Uh, they, I guess in previous years, have had speakers, and it's been kind of an all-day event. Uh, they are not having speakers this year so that they decrease the crowds um, at one specific spot at a time. So you wear masks and they're going to try and social distance, but they'll have vendors and um, I actually on the next screen, this is their flyer. And so there are nurseries that are going to be there and selling things. There are land studies, general vendors that are happening um, and a bunch of nonprofit organizations will be present to probably hand out information or, or um, give you some tips and tricks of certain things. So that also sparked a thought in my brain that as a chapter, we may want to participate in something like this festival next year. So um, keep that in mind also. I wanted to share with you our um, meeting calendar. And we are also in the beginning stages of planning for garden tours and group visits to various locations. Um, so keep an eye out for emails as those opportunities kind of solidify and we get 
things underway. Um, everything's kind of in a fluid process as people are trying to figure out as spring wakes up how they're going to manage crowds and, and how the vaccinations roll out and everything. So uh, there's a lot of things happening, but please feel free if you catch wind of something in your area and you think other members might be interested in it, shoot me an email and I will spread the word for you. Uh, we do have our Facebook group, but I understand it's a little tricky to navigate. So I think that a lot of times if people are making comments on Facebook, um, it's getting lost maybe in the community section. So check out that community section sometimes. Um, but we're, we're working on trying to make it a little more um, accessible. I am checking the chat now. Yes, yes. Um, okay, that looks like old stuff. And I believe that that is probably the last thing I have for the evening. Why am I not going anywhere now? Mm -hmm. There, that was the last thing. Um, if you haven't yet, please consider becoming a member. We've got lots of great things going on. And I want to make, how do I make all of you guys bigger? I see, Rick, you have your hand up. Was that for something that's already happened or do you wanna to talk to us? Um, I just wanted to ask a question in that we just went through a lot of events. Um, are they listed somewhere? You know, cause if I don't put stuff in my calendar, I tend to forget about it. Um, so I wanted to see if, is there a calendar kept on the Facebook group or somewhere that those events like we just listed with the Lancaster event are accessible? Yeah, um, they are not currently. We're working on trying to make the Facebook group uh, a more of a resource. Uh, we're, we're struggling with it, but we're trying. Um, you can always, I know it's not easy, but you can, um, review the recording when it's up on YouTube and then you can like take notes and freeze frame stuff at your leisure. We also do the email that has the highlights of the meeting that will list a lot of things. Susan works hard to make that very thorough. So a lot of times that's a great resource. And you may have joined Rick right after I sent the email that showed um, the dates of a lot of the native nurseries having their opening and things. So I'll try and get that to you. Or if I, if you don't see it in the next day or two, just remind me and I will send it to you. And then the other thing I was kind of curious about is as a new member, um, is there like a directory? Um, it would be nice to find out who lives close to me in Plymouth meeting, you know, in the Montgo area or, you know, close by. Yeah. So that is a great question. I know when I log on to the national website, I can check out chapters and check out the rosters of chapters. I'm not positive if that is because I am a board member um, listed as the president of the chapter or if all paid members have access to that. So um, if you check that out, log on to the website and see if you have access to the, uh, it's called chapter information and then rosters. See if that is something you have access to because that is something we are, um, that's why we do the shout out in the beginning of the meeting to try and get people connected and joined up. Not everybody is comfortable with having their um, location out there or they just, they have various reasons why they don't want their information kind of shareable. So I'm guessing that may be the case and you may be limited to what you can see off of the national website. But um, we need to brainstorm ways to get together. And I think once we're at uh, in-person meetings, it'll become easier because you can talk and chat with the person next to you and things. Uh, but right now it is a struggle for everybody just to kind of connect. Uh, looks like Judy might have something. Yeah, I was going to say you could always put a post on the Facebook um, group and say, hi, my name is so and so. I live here. Is anybody near me? Um, other groups I've seen have done that. I mean, George and I just joined, what, two weeks ago. We're in Telford. 
Uh, we moved to this house in October and it has almost nothing. So we have a lot of work to do. But we have we're, oaks. <laughs> we, yeah, we have oaks. We have lots of oaks, but we're really looking forward to having lots of the house we left. We had taken out all the lawn out back and put in all wildflowers native and we're hoping to do that here too. So thanks for having us. Glad to have you. Um, and I think that's great. The ends of meetings like this would be another great time for us to share things that we have going on, share where we're at, see if there are projects that are happening that you're looking for advice for, or um, again, once we're meeting in person, it's gonna be so much easier to do this and connect with members and be that support system that I want this chapter to be. Um, but, you know, I don't set this so that everybody's muted or so that everybody's um, face is hidden because I want you to be able to do that and talk up and speak and let me know, move the dang chat box and, and things. Um, so I, I appreciate when you wanna talk and share. So you're always welcome. Uh, so in the next couple of days, you'll see that highlights email. Um, I will try and resend the calendar of events that I had amassed um, last week so that hopefully you get to see some things. Um, Susan, I see your sod stripper. Uh, I have used one to remove um, some significant portions of lawn sod is really heavy um it's it's heavier than you think that it's going to be even when you put it on a shallow setting it's fun it's really fun to use um but sod is heavy i have had good success because you can plant immediately into it but it still needs to be monitored for um weed control especially that first year while things are getting established so they're relatively cheap to rent for the day or if you get it i think it's like if you get it on a saturday after five you can keep it until monday kind of thing or you know um check the deals but there's ways to like stretch out the time you can have it um so it definitely works and just know it's heavy so get some like young backs to work for you somebody recommended, that, yeah somebody recommended um that their i forget where it was their neighbor was doing some regrading or something and they slipped the heavy equipment operator like a hundred bucks and he came and like scalped their big section they were working on it sounds like a hundred dollars well spent to me oh, yeah. so maybe keep your eye out for for something like that too Judy, um, your hand is up again. Did that just not go away or do you have something else? It just didn't go away, I think. You get to keep talking forever then. I'm sorry, lower <laughs> my, I didn't see the lower hand. I have, I have lowered my hand. Okay, <laughs> so you. you're welcome, yeah. So each month, um, I when I send out the invitation, I get several members that say they can't make the meeting because they have something else like a conflicting schedule and everybody's tired of zoom I totally get it so make sure that if you ever have to miss a meeting um, you check out the recordings to get you know all of the information uh, I don't take it personally when people can't make it like don't don't worry about that but we did we alternate in case you didn't notice on the calendar we alternate between Wednesdays and Thursdays it's mostly because of my work schedule but I was also hoping to make that a little uh better for people's schedules you know if, if a wednesday is always bad for you you'd never be able to make a meeting so hopefully that works out um check in the chat box again um don't use it in the rain i agree yeah um the sod cutter in mud is not not fun um a sod stripper i've always heard it called a sod cutter and um, you can rent them from any of the like rental places. You know, you can get your carnival tent and your sod cutter, whatever you need. <laughs> Total rental in Pottstown is where we usually get ours. Um, yep, I've 
I've hand removed lawns and I've used sod cutters and various. Yeah, I agree, Susan, shaking your head. It was, um, <laughs> it was not yeah. the best. Um, Karen, you have a lot of awesome things going on in your, um, the email you sent me. It sounds like you have some great gardens and habitats. Um, if you want to unmute, you could talk to people about it. Maybe we could take a, a look down there at that Springton Manor farm. Um, and yes, solarization and the cardboard. Uh, in fact, I want to, I don't know if it'll be next month or the month after, maybe I will update everybody and show you. I had solarized a large par portion of my yard um, to, and planted winter seed sowed a lot of native a seed mix from earth seed and it has little baby sprouts right now so i will keep everybody apprised of the growth there um okay you don't have a, a mic okay um she, so karen's doing a native bee habitat through master naturalists uh and the, she was telling me about the area that they also have a pollinator garden and I think a rain garden kind of in similar proximity, um, a square spade. You can, um, it's it's hard work, but yep, you definitely can. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, if anybody wants to unmute and discuss anything, we can do that. Otherwise, I think that we are at a good spot. I'm so glad everybody joined me tonight and we got to listen to Doug Tallamy's presentation. Um, that reminds me, I want to send out the Oaks presentation also. Oh, we're linked, let's see, chat. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for coming. Um, I wanna send out the Oaks link. I, look, I strategically placed the book here. Um, I'm really excited. So. I picked that up at a really nice bookstore that hosted the presentation I listened to uh, in Phoenixville called Reads and Company. It was so cute. I picked up several other things too. So I recommend checking them out because they obviously host great talent and it was just a lovely little bookstore. So if nobody has anything else, it was great seeing you. Uh, you'll be hearing more from us when we get our uh, act together with other tours and messages. Yeah, Shannon, me too. It was great. My first time there. All right, guys. I'm going to say good night. Good night. Take care. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. That was outstanding. Thank you, guys. Good night. <laughs>